Our reading this morning is from the first book of Kings, and we're reading from the start of the chapter. Now, Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done, and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there, while he himself went a day's journey into the desert. He came to a broom tree, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the tree and fell asleep. All at once, an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around and there by his head was a cake of bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, get up and eat for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. Strengthened by that food, he traveled for 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went into a cave and spent the night. Thank you very much indeed. And if we could have the slides up, then we'll have our reintroduction to the passage. Because <clears throat> this, it seems to me, is one of the strangest passages that we have in the Bible. Um, and it's about one of the greatest prophets that you could ever hear about. And we're just going to reflect for a moment in the introduction about who this person is that this story is happening to. And we're going to read across the Testaments as well as um, back into chapter 18. Who is Elijah? Elijah was a model for John the Baptist to follow. He was, well, in, in Mark's gospel, Mark said, John the Baptist came and he was dressed in a, a coat of camel hair with a leather belt around his waist. And that is exactly the kind of description that there is in the Old Testament about Elijah. So John is following in the pathway of Elijah. And Elijah was one of the towering prophets who was at the transfiguration of Jesus. On the Mount of Transfiguration, two people appeared. Who were they? Moses and Elijah. And they were there in glory. And in both Jewish and Christian speculation about the end times, Elijah is, is in, in big theological language, um, is what you would call an eschatological figure. <laughs> he's, he's coming to do something about the end times. And the disciples say to Jesus, Jesus, we thought Elijah was to come first. And Jesus says, yes, look at John the Baptist. He is fulfilling the role of Elijah. Elijah has come. And uh, even in the book of Revelation chapter 11, you have two figures who come to tell the good news, who are rejected. And the way in which they are described, these figures are based on both Moses and Elijah. Elijah is a crucially important figure across the Testaments. And we remember as we look into chapter 18, Elijah is the victor of Carmel. He has um, broken the back of the prophets of Baal and, uh, and he has conquered for God by his prayer. And then after that, he goes and bows down and says to, he says to Ahab, the rain is coming, Ahab. And he prays and prays and prays seven times before there's this little cloud and then the dark clouds. He is the bringer of rain and he's the enemy of Jezebel. 
Elijah was a prophet who was not afraid to speak truth to power. And Ahab and Jezebel heard what he had to say from God about the idolatry of the people and the way in which they were behaving. Jezebel was the one who was the power behind the throne. She was the one who had introduced all the prophets of Baal. It was her prophets that Elijah had destroyed. And she threatened him by saying, God, do so to me like that, unless I make you like one of them by this time tomorrow. And so she threatens Elijah's life. And what does this great prophet of God do? He runs away. He flees for his life because of what Jezebel has said. So we've got this wonderful man and now he's running away. What, what's it all about? What has happened to Elijah? What is going to happen to Elijah because of all of this? He was a courageous and faithful prophet and now He's running for his life. So we'll return to um, upstairs and go to the second part of the reading before we come to our reflection proper. And the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant broken down your altars and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left and now they're trying to kill me too. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. The Lord said to him, Go back the way you came, and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, Anoint Haziel, king over Aram. Also anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, king over Israel. And anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from Abel Meholah, to succeed you as prophet. Jehu will put to death any who escape the sword of Haziel. And Elisha will put to death any who escape the sword of Jehu. Yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal, and all whose mouths have not kissed him. So Elijah went from there and found Elisha, son of Shaphat. He was ploughing with twelve yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the twelfth pair. Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him. Elisha then left his oxen and ran after Elijah. Let me kiss my father and mother goodbye, he said, and then I will come with you. Go back, Elijah replied. What have I done to you? So Elisha left him and went back. He took his yoke of oxen and slaughtered them. He burned the ploughing equipment to cook the meat and gave it to the people and they ate. Then he set out to follow Elijah and became his attendant. Thanks be to God. Thank you very much indeed. So as we come to reflect on the scriptures, let's pray together. 
Open our eyes, O Lord, that we may see the wonderful truths contained in your word. Amen. I've entitled this message, Looking for God, A Tale of Two Mountains. The two mountains are Carmel and Horeb. So let's try and grasp something of what this passage is, is all about. But before we get to kind of what the lessons are for us today, we need to reflect a bit on the things that are happening to Elijah. What were the things that brought him to this position? One of the things is that he had a great victory. This battle, if you like, against evil and idolatry on Mount Carmel, that Elijah won, calling on God to bring down the fire upon the altar. Elijah didn't realize that to win that particular battle was not to win the war against idolatry. The idolatry of the people was more deeply rooted within the society than even this massive demonstration of the power of God was, was able to um, overcome at this particular point. And so there is a, a great sense of disappointment when he goes to Jezreel and, and there isn't this great change in Jezebel and Ahab. God has demonstrated his power and they don't seem to care. To win the battle was not to win the war. And then he runs away. Now, I tell you, hands up if you've ever run a marathon. One or two. How did you feel at the end? Pretty tired, right. Okay, well, Elijah ran from Mount Carmel to Jezreel, which is about 20 miles. Not quite a marathon, but he was running over rough ground. He was running in sandals. He was running through driving rain. And he gets to Jezreel before Ahab does. I think he would be pretty tired after that as well. And then he goes from Jezreel to Beersheba. Now Beersheba is right at the very south of Judah and it's the furthest away from Jezebel that he could get um, staying within what you would call Israel and Judah. It was as far away as he could get within the Holy Land. But then he does something more. He, he realizes he must go and look for God and he goes to Horeb, which is the mountain where Moses received the law, the, the two tablets of stone. And that's another 200 miles. So he's run 20, he's walked for 100, and now he's walked for another 200. Well, it seems to me that Elijah was probably burnt out by all this stuff that he had done for God. Emotionally, spiritually, physically burnt out. He also experienced the pressure of the lonely prophet. He thought wrongly as it turns out, but he thought, and this is how he felt, everything depends on me. I'm the only one who's standing up for God against these prophets of Baal. There's nobody else. And I'm really cheesed off that I'm, I'm the only one. And he turns and gets, just lies under this broom tree and says, God, I've had enough. It's over. Take my life. I am fed up. But God is not finished. Just as Jezebel sent a messenger to threaten Elijah, so God sends a messenger. The word is, is translated angel in our translations, but it's really just messenger to help Elijah. I was saying to folks earlier that um, I, I have the great privilege of of being one of the chaplaincy team of Edinburgh University. And sometimes students come to us and they're in, in, they're feeling really low about some reason or other. There are three things that I always talk to them about. 
One is, how are you sleeping? How are you eating? What exercise are you doing? Now, Elijah had obviously done too much exercise in the recent <laughs> past, but he hadn't eaten and he hadn't slept. He was needing hydrated, he was needing food, he was needing rest. And he got that. And the angel came to him twice with this food and water. And so as Elijah is looking for God, so God is leading him on to this mountain where Moses was given the law, a place of huge significance for the people of Israel, a place of encounter with the living God. And what, what, what does God say to him when he gets there? What are you doing here, Elijah? Now, I don't know what tone of voice God was using when he said this. It could have been, Elijah, what are you doing here? Or it could be, Elijah, what are you doing here? Um, because he wasn't supposed to be there, really. He'd come there, yes, he'd come looking for God, but he'd come because of the situation that he'd now put himself in. And, and instead, it was like a good politician, he never answered the question. And he says to God, look, look at all your people. They've, they've broken your covenant, destroyed your altars, they're killing your prophets, and I'm the only one left. And he stops. And God knows that he needs to take a breath. Elijah needs to just stop for a minute and experience what it means to encounter the living God. And so... There is a kind of encounter that echoes here what happened on Carmel. The strong wind that broke the rocks, the earthquake and the fire. But Elijah, having experienced God in all of these things on Carmel, no longer experiences God in these things. He had changed. And after all of that, there was a gentle whisper, as I described it, the gentle sukh of the wind. And it was in that whisper that Elijah sensed the profundity of the presence of God. And he goes to the edge of the cave, and God says to him again, So, Elijah, what? What are you doing here? And blow me, he gives the same answer again. Your people have broken your covenant, have destroyed your altars, killed your prophets. I'm the only one left and I'm fed up. It seems to me from the reading of this story that Elijah is a broken man and he's a broken man it seems to me beyond repair I'll explain why I think that in a minute or two he is just so full of complaint to God self-pity yes he was faithful in what he did but he's burnt out now But one of the big things about this is that God does not leave him there at Horeb. Instead of saying, go to the edge of the cave now, God then says, go back. I need you to go back. Yes, your ministry may be effectively over here, but there are things to do to secure your legacy. And there are several things that he's told to do. He's told to anoint two people as kings, and he's told to anoint Elisha as his successor. In fact, he doesn't do any of these anointings. <laughs> what he does is he throws his cloak over Elisha. You are not alone, Elijah. You have a successor. And what is more, there are 7,000 people in Israel who have not bowed to Baal. You are not alone. It's interesting, 
No, I, I think I say it later on. Never mind, we'll move on. Here we come to the lessons that I think we can learn from this passage. And the first one is, it seems to me that we are at greatest risk at the point of our greatest triumphs. Elijah was so all embraced in this victory at Carmel, thinking the war had been won, and instead he discovered it hadn't been, and it, he just disintegrated at that point. It seems to me that, that we, when, when there's lots of things that are happening, that are going well, uh, and, and, well, you know, even thinking about the, 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 the toddlers, the, the parents and toddlers group, it's going well, things are building up, and, and we can get to a point where things are going so well we think it's you know the, the game is won and it's not and at the point of our greatest triumph can be the greatest risk to us and also on a very practical level that high opting activity whether it's in church life or beyond church life it needs to be balanced with rest and refreshment and I think this is very, very true. Um, I, you know, I speak as a, as a minister who's been a minister for 35 years and more. And, and I have known the periods when it's high octane stuff and not taking rest. And it is a very costly thing to do. We need to take the rest and refreshment after the high octane experiences. And however alone we feel like Elijah did, we are never alone. God is always with us, but also God always has his people. And his people are there if we have the eyes to see them. We must remember too, in our day and age, as in the day of Elijah, and the, the idolatry of the world and sometimes as we've looked at the history of the church the idolatry in the church worshiping power and wealth and all the rest of it the war against idolatry and evil is more than one battle and it is not a war that will be won until christ comes others will take on the fight after us it does not all depend on me or us God is the one who will bring about the victory in the end. And God can even use us in our brokenness. God didn't discard Elijah. He used us in our brokenness. And this is the Apostle Paul who talks in 2 Corinthians about we have this treasure of the gospel to share but we have it in jars of clay. We are fragile people, easily broken. But this is so that the overwhelming power may be seen to be of God and not of us. And Elijah had to learn that lesson. And so from Carmel, well, it's being blocked by my picture there, from Carmel to Horeb, Elijah was a different man, broken by the events that happened around him and by his self-pity. And then we find the story of Elisha. And this is a hugely encouraging story that follows on from Elijah. This is his successor. Elijah burnt his bridges to follow Elijah and to, to receive a double, double portion of his spirit. If you read in the books of Kings, about Elisha, you'll find twice as many stories of different kinds than you would find about Elijah. He's got a double portion. And what is more, he went back, he said to Elijah, can I go back and sort of give my mum a hug before I, <laughs> before I come and follow you? And in the gospels, we find someone coming to Jesus and saying, I'll, I will follow you, Jesus. But I want to go and bury my dad first. 
In other words, that was a delaying tactic. This is not a delaying tactic from Elisha. This is an act of utter devotion because what he is doing, these two oxen that he was plowing with, he sacrificed them. He broke the plowing equipment. He used it to cook the oxen and give it away and turned his back on home and followed Elijah. He burned his bridges to be a prophet of God. I think that one of the biggest lessons we can learn in this story of a prophet that has disintegrated, burnt out, that in the messiness of life, and we know that life is really messy, in the messiness of life, God is always at work in ways that we cannot fathom. Even in the life of this, this man who had been so faithful and courageous and now had just burnt out. In the messiness of Elijah's life, God still had something for him to do in order to create the circumstances of a legacy, a prophetic legacy for him. And God is always at work in our lives, even though there are ways that we cannot fathom. Let's just take a moment to reflect on these lessons and, uh, and then have a prayer. Lord, even the greatest of your saints have their troubled times. And some of them have burnt themselves out in your service. Thank you for Elijah. Thank you. We can learn the lessons of his life at this point of great trial and trauma for him. And all the difficulties of our lives. To see how we can do things differently. To see how we can follow in ways that are fruitful not just in the short term or the medium term, but for the long term, as we serve you and your kingdom. Amen.